Thank you, everyone. After that amazing panel, the future of college sports certainly is bright. And I want to thank Professor Cossack, President Starr, uh, Britt Banowski, who is of the Banowski Drive here. His father was president of Pepperdine University, um, Dave Roberts, and Steve Potts. So thank you very much. And so for more bright news or the dark side of college sports, um, we have the law professors looking at the legal issues involved in college sports. Um, how many of you? We're in on an NCA pool, getting involved in little March Madness. All right, how many, <laughs> who, who usually wins those? It's usually the person who knows the least about sports, but even right. those of us who have no interest in sports get interested in March Madness. So there's something captivating of, about college sports. And on the heels of March Madness, we see the money and mania that college sports can, programs can pr produce. Um, what other experience brings people together from all walks of life than the passion and cheering for our favorite sports team? People paint their faces, spend $50 on a hat, a flat bill, even more for a jersey or an, even an NCAA video game of our favorite players, fantasy sports. Um, it, it gets so bad that my students will check ESPN during, during classes. So that's as caught up as we can get into the madness of college sports. But as the pa last panel, questions raised in the last panel reflected, have we gone too far? College sports as a multi-million dollar industry is very highly profitable, but for the very few. Most athletic programs, as, Dean, as President Starr said, are red and they face extraordinary costs. So should higher education really be in the business of commercialized sports, competing for corporate sponsorships, multi-million dollar TV deals, exorbitantly paid coaches, state-of-the-art athletic facilities, and commercializing at least some of our student-athletes. While our educational system is under serious economic pressures, many programs continue to strive to be in the big dance, and it's not cheap. So should the NCAA be given the power to contain the financial arms race and return college sports to its educational mission? The 1984 Supreme Court decision in Board of Regents versus Oklahoma held the NCAA subject to the antitrust laws and struck down an attempt by the NCAA to protect competitive balance and economic interests of all member institutions. This panel will explore the question of whether the NCAA should be accorded an exemption from the antitrust laws as well as other legal issues percolating in college sports. So the question, or one of the proposals from the last panel is, let's require all student athletes to play out their eligibility. Should the NCA and could the NCA impose such a rule? Um, could they impose limits on coaches' salaries? Um, how, can we how can we level the economic playing field? It's my privilege to introduce this distinguished panel of sports law scholars and experts who are gonna be taking on these questions. Um, we have Professor Dan Lazaroff, who is Professor of Law and Director of the Loyola Sports Law Institute at Loyola School of Law. I also want to say that Loyola is hosting their sports law conference tomorrow, and students are, are welcome to attend, so an all-you-can-eat uh, sports law conference weekend. Um, <laughs> more of that tomorrow. Uh, professor Gabe Feldman, who is Associate Professor at Tulane Stu School of Law and Director of the Tulane Sports Law Program, as well as Associate Provost for the NCA Compliance. I also want to acknowledge Gabe and his students at Tulane for hosting the uh, baseball. They do both a sports law moot court competition and a baseball arbitration competition that our students compete in. It's, it's very well, well run. Professor Jeff, Jeff Standen at Willamette University is now soon to be Dean Standen at the University of Northern Kentucky Chase School of Law, so congratulations to you on that post, Jeff. And many of you may know Professor Michael McCann, who's Professor of Law and Director of Sports and Entertainment Law Institute at the University of New Hampshire School of Law, and he's a legal analyst, writer, and a pop popular on the Twitterverse, um, with, and he writes for Sports Illustrated as well. We're going to start off with Professor Lazaroff, who is going to take on the question of this, whether the NCA should have an antitrust exemption, and he questions whether it's sound policy or letting the fox loose in the hen house. Professor Lazaroff. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Western and the uh, Law Review for inviting me. Uh, it's always nice to come to Malibu. It's an easier drive for me than it is to go to work. Um, <laughs> So the question I was assigned was whether the NC2A uh, should receive 
some form of antitrust exemption? And uh, my answer is no. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, 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 no, let me explain my reasons why. Uh, my fallback position is actually if it were granted an antitrust exemption, uh, it should be counterbalanced by some protection of the people uh, who would be adversely affected from the elimination of uh, uh, more competition in the various marketplaces that the NC2A affects. Um, I see a tale of two NC2As, really. I think, I agree with the commercial I always see where they say most NC2A, athlete, NC2A athletes will be going pro in something other than sports. That's obviously true. Uh, the overwhelming majority of NC2A athletes are not going to make a dime playing professional athletics. Uh, in fact, the majority of men's basketball and football players will not earn money as professional athletes. Uh, the percentages are really quite small. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I view men's uh, Division I basketball and FBS top-level football uh, as involving serious commercial markets uh, on a variety of levels, whereas I view the other sports that are often referred to as negative revenue or non-revenue sports as more in line with the traditional student-athlete amateurism model uh, that the NC2A wants to apply across the board. Uh, as uh, Professor Weston mentioned, beginning in 1984, uh, any notion that the NC2A should be uh, treated as simply a, a fosterer of educational values uh, was blown to bits by the Supreme Court's decision in Board of Regents, which dealt with the uh, football uh, television plan for college football. And uh, as a result, and, and, and I, I think we see a lot more output, uh, a lot more college football on television, and a uh, rearrangement of the way in which revenues are distributed because of that. And the court was emphatic in, in saying that uh, absent pro-competitive justifications, this obvious restriction on output and uh, price uh, could not be justified. Uh, I should say that back in 1961, the NC2A, according to some scholars, uh, was actually offered a, an antitrust exemption and uh, declined uh, to push for that because it felt that as, uh, that as an educational organization, uh, it would be protected by its mission from substantive antitrust uh, uh, principles. It turned out that that was uh, an erroneous prediction. <laughs> uh, so. I don't want to step on anybody's toes who are going to talk about the substance of uh, antitrust stuff. I'm supposed to talk about the exemption, but I can't do that without briefly noting what I perceive to be the current state of antitrust law and its application to the NC2A. Uh, I've observed in my own work uh, what I view as a dichotomy between how federal antitrust uh, uh, cases treat uh, restraints of trade that don't involve the student athlete. In other words, do not involve the no agent rule or the no draft rule or uh, the no extra benefits rule or the no multi-year scholarship or the, uh, the cap on amount of uh, grant and aid. Uh, those cases, the NC2A fares reasonably well in defending. Uh, in cases that involve, however, uh, coaches' salaries, the television case which I mentioned, and others, uh, they've had a more difficult path, and that is why uh, they, they lost the, the Board of Regents case. They paid out substantial amounts of money in the law NC2A case that involved so-called restricted earnings coaches. Uh, they settled uh, an antitrust case involving the NIT tournament, which involved them buying it out for a considerable amount of money and, and attorney's fees as well. Uh, so. My perception is, notwithstanding its uh, uh, activities within the context of uh, alleged amateur athletics, uh, antitrust law has been applied to NC2A activities, I think, in the non-student athlete area, in a fairly consistent manner to the way it's been applied in the professional context. Uh, now, there are a couple of antitrust exemptions in the professional context that uh, have no parallel in, in, in NC2A, such as the statutes that allow the AFL or the NFL to merge uh, in, in, in uh, the 60s and also the Sports Broadcasting Act. But getting to the athlete area, which I think is the hot topic now, uh, 
I think the NC2A is under siege, and I think uh, it is with some justification that it's under siege. Uh, there may have been a time when college athletics, even in basketball and football, uh, could be accurately described within this amateurism model, although uh, I'm always amused by something I found in my research once uh, by Professor Zimbalist that said in 1852 the Harvard and Yale rowing crews were lured into a competition with lavish prizes and unlimited alcohol for the winners. Mm -hmm. uh, and Yale actually had a $100,000 football slush fund back then. Uh, I can't do the math in my head to figure out what that is in current dollars, but it's in the millions. Uh, but I would say, while that model, the traditional student-athlete amateurism model, may have made sense uh, years ago, it just doesn't make sense to me and to some others who've commented on it today. Uh, I listened carefully to the commentary during the first panel about programs losing money. Uh, but the fact remains that if you look at the TV contracts for the uh, uh, NC2A basketball tournament, if you look at the TV contracts that schools and conferences have, uh, if you look at what coaches are earning, I think it is accurate to say that the only people who are not making money as individuals anyway, or as inst well institutions as I said, depends on how you do your accounting, uh, would be the athletes. And without them, there's, there's no product. And um, in the pending O'Bannon case, uh, which is scheduled to have a class certification hearing on June 20th, I believe, if it ever went to trial, it wouldn't be for at least another year, I think, after that. And in two recent cases, one in the Seventh Circuit and uh, just a month ago in, in, in a federal district court in Indiana, uh, the courts tossed student athletes claims under antitrust law based on their failure to articulate a, a proper relevant, uh, pro relevant product market. Uh, they were challenging multi-year scholarships, uh, whether there should be multi-year scholarships, and uh, the second case, the Rock case, uh, was challenging that as well as the inability of Division three schools to award athletic scholarships. And in each case, uh, I, took, I took the cases as, as a double-edged sword. On the one hand, the NC2A won because the plaintiff's uh, complaints were dismissed. But unlike earlier cases involving student athletes, uh, these cases acknowledge that there is a commercial relationship between the student athlete and their institutions. In the same way that you, who are students who may not even be student athletes or never have been, you have a commercial relationship with your institution. If this law school and my law school were to fix tuition rates and we were found out, we would get in trouble. If the institutions tried to fix the salaries of faculty, we would get in trouble, and deservedly so. Uh, so getting back to the student athletes, uh, there was a case that was settled a couple of years ago in the Central District of California. Some of you may have read about it. There were no reported opinions in it, but I've read the opinions. It was called White versus NC2A. It was a class action brought by a former Stanford football player. And uh, a local plaintiff's antitrust firm handled it, and Judge Klausner did not dismiss the complaint. He recognized, at least for pleading purposes, that a relevant market in, in college football, uh, scholarship college football players and scholarship basketball players uh, was, at least for pleading purposes, a legally cognizable market. The class was certified and uh, the case was settled for somewhere in the neighborhood of $250 million. Not all of that was new money. A lot of it was money that was just shifted, but there was some new money involved. Uh, so where does this leave us? I think it leaves us with a mixed result. The NC2A succeeded in the recent Agnew and Rock cases. What happens in the O'Bannon case remains to be seen. Uh, whether the class will be certified or not, I think is problematic for reasons I'm not going to get into. But obviously what this leads us to is a desire on the part of people, you know, like a president of a university or a compliance uh, uh, director or others in university administration, uh, they would love to have, I think, the NC2A granted an antitrust exemption by Congress, which would prevent these lawsuits from being brought uh, whether or not they had a, an adverse effect on competition. Uh, the reason I oppose that uh, is that um, 
the rationales that have been used for granting antitrust exemptions over the years by, co by Congress, and then there's an area of non-statutory, judicially created exemption, which I'm not going to talk about. The rationales, and by the way, this is a very, very uh, uh, lo lovely read if you're having trouble going to sleep at night. Uh, there's a monograph by the ABA antitrust section uh, that was uh, put out about 400 pages a few years ago. It covers the history of federal statutory antitrust exemptions, and it lists every one, discusses the rationales for most of them, uh, and, and uh, in anticipation of having to draft an article by June 1 and, 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 and coming here, I thought I ought to look this through with more detail uh, and care than I had in the past. And, you find some common themes through most antitrust exemptions. Uh, in some cases, it's because you're trying to allow small sellers or buyers to jointly form a cooperative to compete with larger buyers or sellers. Or exemptions have been granted to help American businesses compete in international markets. In other cases, there's the perception that there's a natural monopoly at work. Uh, in a few cases, they, they have been designed to grant subsidies to a favored group uh, or, or a segment of, of, of an industry. Uh, and they're varied. There have been about 40 of them since the inception of the antitrust laws, just the statutory ones. I'm not talking about the Nor Pennington Doctrine or the State Action Doctrine, which are judgment, or the non statutory labor exemption, which I'm sure you studied about if you took sports law. I'm talking about just the laws that Congress has enacted. And when I look at the landscape of NC2A sports, what would be the rationale for giving the NC2A an exemption? They're already, according to some courts and some commentators, vis-a-vis -vis the athletes, a collusive monopsonist, basically collectively exercising market power in purchasing services from the athletes. Uh, some people have even argued in their writing that athletes should be able to unionize because they meet the criteria uh, for labor organizations under the National Labor Relations Act. I'm not going to go off on that tangent, but there's no question that in part they are selling their services and people say, well, you're getting an education for it. But if you listen carefully during the first hour, what they're really getting is an opportunity to get an education, which in many cases they know going in they're not going to really pursue. If you're good enough to be one and done, in some cases your coach will tell the media that you're not going to be back next year even before you announce it. That happened uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, so I think we have to be realistic about what's going on here. At the highest levels of college football and college basketball, perhaps some of the women's basketball too, uh, notwithstanding the comments during, during the first uh, panel, I think you're dealing with a situation where players are providing the raw material for a commercial product, and yes, they are being compensated for it, but compensated at what amounts to a fixed wage. Now, that fixed wage varies somewhat because the value of an education at different schools varies, but there's a cap there. And, and um, an antitrust exemption would allow the NCA to avoid any further litigation about that. Uh, and one might say the rationale is to preserve the uh, clear line of demarcation between amateur sports and professional sports, which the NC2A handbook talks about. But I think that ship has sailed. I think that at, at the highest levels of men's football and, and, and basketball, uh, the commercialization of the sport is, is, is evident in abundance and it's not going to go back the other way. So I've seen proposals for antitrust exemptions ranging from a broad one coupled with providing due process to people who uh, are charged with, antitrust, uh, with uh, NC2A violations. My problem with that, as much as I would like to see the NC2A provide more uh, fairness of process to those charged, is that that doesn't address the anti-competitive concerns of some of their regulations at all. It addresses a basic fairness question. And speaking of fairness, in the first uh, uh, session, people were saying, well, we think it's fair that you know, people are given an opportunity to get a fine education in exchange for playing. Well, the question under federal antitrust law is not whether you're getting what somebody thinks is a fair uh, wage or a fair price, it's what the market will bear. 
And there needs to be a strong rationale, it seems to me, for deviating from that model. And I don't see it here where you have a dominant uh, uh, organization comprised of over a thousand different schools. In this recent case, the Rock case in Indiana, the judge said, well, you don't have to go to an NC2A institution. But to me, that's comparing uh, playing hockey in the National Hockey League with playing in, in, in some uh, over 30 league at the local uh, uh, ice skating rink. They, they don't compare. Uh, the, the level of quality and exposure don't compare. They're not reasonable substitutes for the athlete. So uh, I know that we have limited time. So what I'm saying is that if you, if, if Congress were to reject the idea of doing nothing and wants to provide some sort of exemption, uh, what do we do to counterbalance that reinforcement of, of market power that the NC2 has, both as a seller of their college uh, athletic product and as a buyer of, uh, in the input market of the raw materials, the, the labor, if you will, the players? Uh, and, and that, to me, would seem to involve some sort of oversight. But who would do the oversight? I mean, is it, is it good to uh, in, in involve some sort of federal agency uh, in overseeing all these schools and whether uh, the, the purposes for which the exemption would be granted, whether those purposes were being furthered? I mean, some rationale for the exemption is, will there be more money left over for women's sports and men's non-revenue sports? Uh, Okay, so, so the answer is, well, how are you going to ensure that that be done? So, so my position is, uh, unless a more clearly persuasive rationale can be articulated, uh, I would not be in favor of granting an exemption. I would rather see the NC2A have to defend itself in court. And frankly, uh, maybe this tips my hand a little, I think uh, whether it's in the O'Bannon litigation, which is, after, if the class is certified or in some other litigation, the courts need to recognize the economic realities that exist now in big time college sports. The men's basketball players and the football players and perhaps some of the women's basketball and volleyball players are not in the same position uh, as the non-revenue sports. As was said during the first panel, if you look at the number of hours they have to dedicate to practice, and conditioning and other things. They are essentially workers. And, and uh, since my time is up, I'll just have to elaborate on this if I get asked questions about it, so thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor <laughs> Lazaroff. Each of the speakers is contributing an article to the Law Review, and we wanna thank you for that. Um, and next, to take on a pro who, who is proposing how to tame the NCA antitrust be beast, we have Professor Feldman. I'm going to stand. I have trouble speaking when I'm sitting. You'll notice that I always try to stand when I'm, uh, when I'm speaking. And uh, I want to thank Professor West and everyone at Pepperdine for, for inviting me here, for putting this on. This is a, a great set of panels you have put together. And I don't say that just because I'm on one of them. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's really an impressive group. So congratulations to everyone for, for putting this together. I'm going to start with my conclusion. Um, just so I can get it out there. So spoiler alert, if you plan on reading my article, this is how it ends. <laughs> I agree with Professor Lazaroff that the NCAA is not, should not be entitled to an antitrust exemption, but I understand why they want the exemption. And it's not just, I think, because they want to gouge and exploit student athletes. Maybe some of that, but I don't think that's the only reason behind it. I think the NCAA wants an antitrust exemption for the same reason that the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, and every other sports league in the country wants an antitrust exemption. Part of that, again, may be because they want to gouge their workers and their players, but I also think part of it is they don't believe, one, that antitrust law should apply to sports, period. Two, I think they believe that antitrust law cannot apply to sports. And I think the NCAA probably has a stronger argument there. And I think it's a stronger argument because of this Board of Regents case we've been talking about and because of this amateurism defense that's out there. So let me now back up and, and walk us quickly through this amateurism defense that was born in large part from this Board of Regents case. And, and really where I want to start is the, the notion that we've heard a lot today and, and the question that's been raised by this panel and a lot of other panels is 
Is amateurism, the idea of amateurism, dead? Have we reached that tipping point where it's no longer going to be a valid antitrust defense? Is it, as the sport of big time college football, big time college basketball become too big to, with a straight face, say that amateurism is still alive? And lots of reasons to be able to support the conclusion that it's, it's going to collapse onto itself, that, that it's dead. And we've talked about some of those this morning. If you think about the exploitation of college athletes, what, what they're required to do, the risk they put themselves at, how much they give and how little they get. And you can focus on whether it's Ed O'Bannon or you can focus on Kevin Ware, the sacrifices they make. Now, Kevin Ware, that was not the NCAA intentionally, gruesomely breaking his leg, but <laughs> when players go out there to play sports, they put themselves at risk with no promise of compensation. We all put ourselves at risk when we play sports. I'm not saying that we should all be paid for every time we play sports. I broke my leg playing touch football. I don't expect people to pay me. I know, it's sad. I broke my leg playing touch football. It's, it's true. <laughs> Just leave it at that. Um, but if you put what the athletes go through, and we talked about, well, the school spends seven times as much money on these athletes and because they maybe put in seven times as much work, you compare the sacrifices they make versus the billion dollar television deals, the million dollar coaching salaries, the chase for the money, it's conference realignment. That disparity troubles people, understandably. We can talk about what the right solution is, but that's problematic. At least atmospherically, it's problematic. What I want to suggest to counteract the notion that this is it, this is the end, the NCAA is going to fundamentally change because of this disparity. What I want to suggest is this is not new. We've had people since as long as there have been panels like this talking about the death of the NCAA because of amateurism. That amateurism is a sham. This is not a 2013 concept. Let me give you a quote from the Carnegie Foundation president. College athletics under the spur of commercialism has become a monstrous cancer which is rapidly eating out the moral and intellectual life of our educational institutions. That sounds like something Joe Nassera might have written last week for the New York Times, right? criticizing <laughs> the NCAA. That was said by the president of the Carnegie Foundation in 1929, before we had what we consider, obviously, big time college sports. When college athletes were awarded scholarships for the first time, people said, that's the death of college sports. That's the death of amateurism. That's vulgar to think about college athletes being given some compensation directly or indirectly for playing sports. Let them get financial aid like every other student on campus if they need it. Why should they get special treatment because they are a college athlete? When you talk about conference realignment, the explosion of conference realignment, and what's been happening, it's happening to my uh, school right now, my home, Tulane. I mean, we're, we're now in the, I think we've been renamed the American Athletic Conference. Uh, we, we thought we were in the Big East, we were in the Conference USA. We're now basically in Conference USA 2.0. It just happens to have a different name. But that's not new. The 1990s, early 1990s, Harvey Schiller led a move for conference realignment, maybe unknowingly, but the idea in 1990 was if we have a certain number of teams in a conference, we can have a conference championship game. And if we have a conference championship game, we can get a lot more money from TV. So everybody said, let's grab more schools so we can have enough schools to have a conference championship game. Not only was our conference realignment, about 40 schools moved back then, but conferences collapsed. A lot of you in the room probably have never heard of the Southwest Conference. That was a power conference. It's gone. This conference realignment problem is not new. It's troubling. It's not new. Television rights, astronomical. That's not new either. 1994, there was a massive shift in television rights. And the massive shift was spurred in part because a small network, called Fox at the time, wanted to become a major player, wanted to become a major network. What did they do? They outbid CBS for the right to NFL games. They paid $1.5 billion for a four-year deal to cover the NFC games. That left CBS without the NFL. What did the CBS do? They said, well, we need big time football. Let's pay for the rights to televise SEC football. And let's pay them $85 million over five years span. That was an explosion then. The numbers are not nearly as big as they are now, but at the time, people said, this is no longer college sports. How can we say this is amateurism? The judges are going to change their mind. They're going to look at this and say, this can no longer stand. We can't defer to the NCAA on the grounds of amateurism. They've been saying that since 
1929. It's now 2000, 2013. Are we at that point? Are we at that tipping point? I think the only reason people weren't asking this question 30 years ago is because Malcolm Gladwell hadn't given us the phrase tipping point. But <laughs> it's the same issue. I don't know that we're there or we're not there. But what I think is troubling about the amateurism argument, and this gets us into the border regions case, you see where the amateurism argument really comes from and what it means. In the from the inception of television, the NCAA, and Professor Lazaroff mentioned this briefly, the NCAA feared television. They thought it would destroy their product. Why would it destroy their product? For two reasons. One, it would destroy live attendance. And that's how people made money. That's how schools made money. People paid tickets to see the games in person. They also thought it would destroy competitive balance. It would create a TV aristocracy. That the teams that were on TV more often would get more money, attract more students. There would just be a dominant few schools. So they said, in order to protect the game, we need to limit televised football. And their limit was not particularly flexible. The limit was, you cannot televise football games first. And they said, well, maybe we should be a little less restrictive, so you can be on television one time a year. And that eventually morphed into the plan that was challenged in that Board of Regents case. That said that the two networks combined who were covering college football, total could show 48 college football games in a given year, total. Each network could only show 24 games. Think about that compared to today. If you turn on a television during college football season on a Saturday, you can watch 24 games on that Saturday. You could only watch 24 for the entire year under the old rule. So a bunch of powerful football programs got together and said, this is a restriction on our ability to compete and to make money. So you had Oklahoma, Georgia, some of these big schools from the old Southwest Conference sued. And they sued and said, our teams would be on television a lot more. We'd be able to compete more effectively for student athletes, for regular students, for donations, for everything else. You are restricting our ability to compete. And the case wound its way up to the Supreme Court. And there's a fascinating sidebar. I don't think I have time to say this, but I'm going to squeeze it anyway just because I think it's so fascinating. The um, University of Texas is one of the schools that wanted to be able to show its football team more often on television. So, so they were one of the plaintiffs. There was a con law professor at the University of Texas who was the head of the NCAA's Commission on Infractions. And when this breakaway group decided they were going to sign a TV deal with NBC to show their games more frequently, the NCAA stepped in with this con law professor at the head and said, you're going to go on probation if you do this, and we're not going to allow any of your other teams to compete in NCAA championships. Threaten. So CFA sued. Con law professor is in his classroom teaching his con law class one day. And his secretary walks in with a process server. <laughs> hands on a piece of paper and says, you are being sued. <laughs> Who am I being sued by? University of Texas. I, I work for University of Texas. Yes, but you're the chair of the infractions committee for the NCAA who's threatening this institution if they sign this contract with NBC. So we get this landmark lawsuit. The argument that the NCAA makes to justify its restriction on television is that, again, need to protect live attendance, needed to protect competitive balance, whatever that might mean, and sort of overarching theme was they need these restrictions, like all the restrictions they have in place, to maintain amateurism and to maintain a focus on education. So the case winds its way through the court. Lower court finds that the plan is illegal. Court of Appeals finds that the plan is illegal. In each of those courts, the NCAA attorneys hammered home this idea of amateurism and educational ideals as being a reason that these restrictions should be legal. When it gets to the Supreme Court, a guy by the name of Easterbrook is representing the NCAA. His arguments to the Supreme Court did not focus on amateurism or educational ideals at all, did not make the argument to the Supreme Court. His arguments were economic arguments. NCAA doesn't have market power. They can't have achieved anti-competitive effects because there is no market power. He said the NCAA was a single entity incapable of violating Section 1 of the Sherman Act. During our oral argument, Justice White, former NCAA football player, said, Professor Easterbrook, why haven't you made the educational argument, the amateurism argument? Judge Easterbrook's response, Professor Easterbrook's response at the time was, because it's not a valid argument under antitrust law. <laughs> it's a losing argument. This court has made clear that arguments like amateurism or social welfare goals are not relevant to the antitrust analysis. All antitrust law cares about, focuses on, is the effect on competition, economic effect on competition. Not whether or not you can make your product have a beneficial impact on so, some social goal. 
Antitrust law is just not designed to deal with that. So Supreme Court strikes down this television restriction. Focusing on whether or not it protects live attendance, it says it doesn't really do that. Focus on competitive balance, they say, well, the NCAA really doesn't quite care about competitive balance the same way the NFL does. We can talk about how, what competitive balance means in the context of the NCAA. What's, I think, interesting for today going forward is the NCAA has recently essentially abandoned the competitive balance argument. They have said, they've conceded, Mark Emmert recently conceded as part of their new legislative reform, that there are going to be haves and have-nots. Michigan is always going to be Michigan. Michigan is going to have advantages over other schools. LSU is never going to be on the same footing as Louisiana Lafayette. The rules we would need to put in place to try to maintain competitive balance are absurd. It leads to a 500-page NCAA manual that says you can text people on certain days, you can send pamphlets that are a certain number of pages of certain font to try to maintain balance. It said there's no way the NCAA should be in that business. Let's just get rid of it. And even if we wanted to be in that business, there's only so much we can do. There's going to be imbalance. And I think fans appreciate some imbalance. People go to homecoming games because you know your team's going to win. That's why, and I, this is no offense to the other Duke alum in the, in the crowd, that's why Duke football gets scheduled for so many homecoming football games. <laughs> Competitive balance is no longer really a legitimate justifiable argument for the NCAA antitrust law. All we're left with is amateurism. The problem with having amateurism as the linchpin of an antitrust defense is it's not a valid antitrust defense. It's a social welfare goal. Antitrust law does not know how to compute social welfare, welfare goals. The test in antitrust law, the rule of reason, is to balance competitive effects, pro-competitive benefits versus anti-competitive effects. It's hard enough for judges to look at positive economic effects and then balance them against negative economic effects. I don't know how you ask a court to look at the harm that is done to competition by restrictions on student athletes and balance that versus the social welfare gain by maintaining and promoting amateurism. I don't think the rule of reason works. I wouldn't give them an exemption. I think we've got to find a new test. I think we've got to find a better test that makes sure that these college athletes and the market is not being exploited but also making sure that the NCAA is allowed to continue to work on its mission, its admirable mission. We heard a lot about this, that the 99% of what the NCAA does is focus on the student athletes, the ones who are there to get the education, the ones who aren't turning pro in sports. Those are conflicting interests. I think there has to be a balance. I don't think the rule of reason can do that balance. I don't think it's equipped to do that. I think the challenge is to come up with a test that can do that. So, I'm working on that challenge. I have a modest proposal at the end of my article. I don't have time to go on it now. But I'm going to stop there, because um, I'd like to leave some time for, for Q&A. But, but I just, when, when thinking about what that Board of Regents case did, and it struck down the television restrictions. It led to this arms race we have now. But it also gave this very valuable weapon for the NCAA's antitrust arsenal. I, I just don't think it makes sense from an antitrust perspective. So I will leave it at that. Thank you, Professor Feldman. After hearing about that Texas con law professor, I'm not going to be accepting these little note cards because it could be a summons. Um, so I will, but I, we're, we're also going to plan time to have live audience. Um, but you can do the note cards too. But um, OK, thank you for that. Next, we have uh, Professor Standen talking about foot faults in crunch time. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing that uh, as an avid tennis player. So looking at sports law and antitrust reg regulation, Dean Standen. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Professor uh, Weston. It's wonderful to be here. What a, what a great and uh, famous law school. Congratulations to all the students who are in attendance here. Uh, this is a special place, and uh, I'd never been here before. I got here last night and took one look at the view and immediately texted my resume to the dean. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's a beautiful spot along with a uh, great law school, so I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I want to make a couple of suggestions, I suppose, uh, by, by way of commentary on the first couple of speakers as to why the NCAA and, and other sports organizations are so eager to escape the, the clutches of antitrust law and why they want an exemption. It's, uh, well, the obvious reason it's a good thing and people want good things, 
But I'm going to go a little further and suggest that antitrust is itself a terrible regulator. It's a terrible uh, statute and causes huge problems for people who are subject to its, uh, its provisions. And that's why they want out. Um, everyone wants out of antitrust law it, because it, it's, a, it's a bad rule of law. And the reason it's a bad rule of law is because, as Professor Feldman uh, mentions, uh, is because of the rule of, of reason. That the rule of reason basically tells the, uh, the judge, or really it tells the jury, the juries are the ones who, who are ass assessing this, uh, this statute, to uh, vary the rule of law and to vary it temporally. To vary it by the time, the circumstances, the context in which the uh, antitrust question uh, is, 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 uh, is an operation. And so the antitrust law is the ultimate, as I think of law more generally, the ultimate law in terms of temporal variance, varying the, the call, if you will, of the official by the time of the game. And so I think about that issue, about the vari variability of antitrust law, how this broad standard, this rule of reason, that empowers the jury and the judge to simply assess the, uh, on a large and economic scale, the competitive benefits and welfare uh, detriments of a proposed change in business. I think of, of sports law, because that's what I do. And sports is just a wonderful area to study. It's a great laboratory for a, a student of law, a law professor, to see law happen, to see rules in action to, uh, to test theories of legality. And I think, do we see anything like that in sports? Do we see uh, the rules of the game vary according to the circumstances of the game? And what I'm talking about in my paper uh, is foot faults in crunch time. The, 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 the uh, tendency of game officials, referees, umpires, to vary the call by the circumstances of the game. To referee the scoreboard, as they say, and not, not the action. So I wrote a lot about uh, footfalls in crunch time. I'm referring to the event a few years ago where uh, Serena Williams was in the final uh, match of the US Open. And at a clutch point toward the end of the match, the, uh, the lines person, I guess it would be, called a footfault on, on Serena. And she got a little upset uh, by that. <laughs> but in the com as I watched the event on television, the commentators were saying, oh, you, you don't call, make that call at this time. You don't call a footfault in crunch time. Uh, in other words, the, sorry? especially on Serena. Yeah, that's what I really, that's what they really meant. But uh, and it, it, it troubled me a little then, and I want to write about it here. It was why? Why should the rule of law, which antitrust totally embraces, vary according to the circumstances in which it's applied? Um, and does sports give us an answer? So I wrote a very, for me, a very fun paper. I enjoyed every, every minute of it. Um, good luck to the editor. But, I, but I, had, I had fun just thinking about that issue. It's, a, it's, a, it's an issue in sports law. It's an issue, of course, in all of jurisprudence. So it has some bigger connotations. Um, and and I, a couple of thoughts I wrote the paper and presented to you. It's, it's still in draft. But uh, I'll, I'll just highlight three of the, uh, of the arguments I make there. I make several others. But first of all, um, I want to address the idea of no harm, no foul. Uh, I'm not sure to, who, to whom to attribute that quote initially, but I'm, I'm arguing that that's a myth. That there really are no rules in sport, and I'll perhaps um, in a moment or two, if I have time, uh, analogize that out to antitrust law and other bodies of law. But no rules of sports really are, in fact, harmless. Um, a pitch that is not a strike is a ball. Every, every pitch in baseball incrementally affects the probability of winning, and losing on behalf of the teams. Every play in basketball, every call in football, all of them incrementally affect the, the, odd, the odds of winning. Uh, something in sports is always gained or lost. And therefore, all decisions by the, the umpires, the judges, the referees, to call a foul or not call a foul, to impose a penalty or not impose a penalty, um, has repercussions. In other words, I argue in this part of the paper, that a decision not to enforce the rules is, in fact, never costless. Um, all decisions to enforce or not enforce have, have a cost. And what I'm arguing against there really is uh, HLA Hart's idea that some rules of law were, were, are, are meant to be varied temporally. He talked about, he, he, he had this notion, Hart did, of the, uh, he called the power conferring rule of law. And his, his example was, uh, was the uh, famous 
example involving the requirement that it takes two people to witness a will for a will to be an effective instrument. And, and Hart's argument was, well, if there was only one witness to a, a will, then, and someone writes a will with but one witness, then nothing has happened. In other words, one simply failed to, to uh, create the will, and therefore nothing in a legal sense happened with the only one witness will. And my argument is that, although perhaps that applies there, there are no rules in sports, and certainly no, not in antitrust law, that are in fact looked that way. That's power conferring. The failure to throw a strike is not simply nothing happening, it's ball one. The failure to hit a serve in tennis that's in the boundary is not just a failure to have a proper serve, it's also fault one, I think it's called, right? A fault, first fault of a two-fault system. So all rules uh, have, of sports have, and all enforcements, I should say, have, uh, have harm uh, attached to them, and non-enforcement as well. Point two uh, is, uh, First point one was uh, no harm, no foul is a myth. Point two is um, you never know even when you know. As Yogi Berra <laughs> said that, and uh, you never know even when you know. And as, as always, the great sage was, was correct. You never know even when you do know. And what he's talking about there, what I'm talking about there, I suppose, is this idea that the referee at the end of the game or in certain situations should not call a foul you know, should swallow his whistle, as they say in, in uh, basketball, or don't call the ticky-tack, I hear that phrase, uh, call, expand, don't call strike three in the ninth inning, right? Make it a really good strike, right? Uh, those kinds of things you hear said. Don't call foot faults in crunch time, as Serena seemed to be saying as she threw her racket and stuff. Um, I think she was saying that. Uh, that, that sort of thinking, uh, it, it's, it's, it's wrong. It's, uh, because you never know even when you know. In other words, the idea expressed there, and Mitchell Berman, Professor Berman talked about this in his Georgetown Law Review article just a, a, a few months ago, or I guess a year, about a year ago now. But Berman, speaking about sports law, uh, speaking about referees making calls in clutch time, he said, he said that they should be aware and should be mindful of the consequences of their calls. That the reason the umpire, the referee, doesn't make that call in the clutch in the, in the waning moments of a close contest is because that penalty, that uniform penalty, will so impact the likelihood of victory, uh, will so uh, create the opportunity for defeat, if you will, on the other hand, that uh, the referee sh uh, call will be so consequential that he shouldn't make it there. And uh, I I'm taking the side against that of Yogi Berra to say no, that that's a bit of a myth, that the referee never really knows what's coming next, right? The, the call of ball four in the second inning might start a rally that, that puts one team so far ahead, the game is effectively over. The call in the first quarter of uh, pass interference to negate a uh, touchdown play or, or whatever that would work, or holding, I guess, to call back a touchdown play in football, it takes the seven points, as they say, off the scoreboard. That could be game deciding right then. The, the entire point, in fact, of the modern Moneyball era, with the, with the modern analysis of game metrics, is to say that that is to wash away that whole idea of of clutchiness. There's no such thing as a clutch hitter. Say the Moneyball people. It's just a question of application of probability from large sample sizes to the uh, to, to the to, to the next contest at hand. All at bats are the same. RBIs are are luck. They're not. A, there's, no, there's no such thing as a clutch hitter. Right? That's the whole point of Moneyball, is to strip away those perceptions that we, the fans, try to uh, add in to our enjoyment of the game. And the same thing is true of antitrust, uh, is, is my point here for today, that basically when the courts and the juries are asked to predict the market effect, pro and con, of a hypothetical change in business practice, they're making a guess as to the future. They could be in the second inning for all they know. They could be in the end game. They have no idea where they are. It's, it's a national economy, an international economy that's going to motor along long after, um, you know, this conference is over even, I'm hoping, right? There's always going to be in America. Put that in, in the notes there. So, uh, you know, how, it's a prediction about, uh, antitrust asks a jury to make a prediction about these, these forces, uh, uh, um, the, the repercussions of its decision that I don't think anyone could, could make. 
uh, even a trained and highly skilled economist couldn't make those, at least not too convincingly. Um, how can legality change if the law doesn't? Antitrust laws are, are written, they are, don't, don't change. How can legality change temporally? Well, it's a foul is a foul, second inning or ninth. And finally here, I'll, I'll keep it a little short, uh, the last point I, I want to make here is uh, uh, quoting Casey Stengel, rules is rules. Rules is rules, he said. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and he's right, that it's, it's not, rules is rules. It's not a good idea to vary the penalties of law according to the effect of, uh, on the wrongdoer of the penalty, right? In criminal sentencing, if uh, the rich man commits crime A and the poor man commits crime A, well then, ideally, person A and per, uh, the, these two people, the rich and the poor, serve the equivalent one-year sentence. The federal law, anyway, prohibits federal courts from saying, you know, the effect on the wealthy person of a year incarceration will be a substantial loss in income, might be disbarment if he's a lawyer or a stockbroker, right? Might have huge effects on some industry, right? All these are prohibited considerations, right? That we say, no, turn a blind eye to that. Otherwise, we'd have a prison, well, we kind of do, but populated by comparatively poor people with wealthy people saying, well, I just got a, I just got a week and paid a gigantic fine. Now, there is some trade-off, I know. I worked in that area for a long time. There is some trade-off, I know, between the two. But by and large, the law says that our ideal is, no, you, one person, one year. You know, we don't look to the circumstances. Rules is rules. And uh, antitrust law says the opposite. Right? Antitrust law says, let's consider the benefit the company's producing, the benefit the trade practice or whatever it is is producing, compare it to the consumer welfare. Right? Um, but even the civil law, we don't, we don't excuse the poor person, if you will, from a, thank you, from a large damages judgment even though he or she can't pay it, the judgment is still taken. The debt may never be collected, but the judgment's still taken, right? We, we never excuse the imposition of penalties even where there are potentially devastating effects on the, uh, on the offender. We just impose the penalty and deal with the effects later on. So I just a couple minutes left. Um, I'm gonna go one step further, okay? The entire trend in sports officiating and I would argue in law is completely against what we see in antitrust law. I would give it up if I were you specialist. I would, I would move on. Because why? Because look at, look at sports. I always look there. Instant replay is designed to do one thing, to eliminate foot faults in crunch time, to eliminate temporal uh, variance in game refereeing. We don't want the official in the NFL saying, well, it was a marginal call, it looked like a catch such a clutch moment, we'll give it to them or whatever. No, the, the, the replay comes in, right, right, to take away that discretion. And the referee will look at every angle tediously, right, every possible, you know, finger on that ball to make the decision about whether or not the ball was caught, right, or the home run reached the stands, right. On, so, so the trend in sports, the trend in law is to eliminate discretion on the part of officials. Criminal sentencing, I alluded to that a moment ago. Sentencing guidelines, a huge innovation to eliminate discretion from a judge. What, what the judges thought to be their most essential moment of discretion, that is the sentencing of criminal offenders, taken away. Okay. So antitrust law is an outlier. Uh, antitrust law, which invites, by its very standards, invites this, this uh, uh, variation according to circumstance, is an outlier. Um, I could talk more I, I, about this, I did. But uh, I understand sports, right? Fa you know, you, you might say well, you know, it's fast-moving situations involving judgment. We need to view the, the referees with judgment, right? And that they're going to sometimes use that to, to not call foot faults in crunch time. And maybe that has merit there. But antitrust law doesn't feature fast-moving athletes. It, it features slow-moving business people, right? And uh, it presents no special call for temporal variance in its applications. Right? In fact, I would go further, I'll, I'll close with this, um, that its, it's broad legal standards uh, actually militate in favor 
of invariant applications, right? Because we can distinguish with, in a principled way between, I would suggest, between reasonable and, and an un, uh, um, an unreasonable restraints in trade. Uh, but that, the, the curiosity to me is that antitrust law has evolved in precisely the opposite way to the point where temporal variance, contextual variance in application is the norm of antitrust law, not the exception. And to me, that appears a damaging proposition, damaging to the uh, creation of, of principles of law that would, over time, I would suggest, promote vigorous market competition, which is what antitrust law is supposed to, to further. So, thanks. Fascinating presentation, Jeff. Next we have Pro Professor McCann, who is going to take us in a, another direction, but then bring us back. Um, so we're all going to either fear flying or, or get on board here. So he's going to take up the case of Royce Weiss and talk about anxiety disorder. So I'm all ears. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Weston. Thank you, uh, Dean Taka. And also thank you to the Pepperdine Law community for having me here today. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this panel. I also want to highlight the work of Michael Wood, who is on the Law Review. I don't know if he's in the room, but I think as every panelist can attest to, I've never been part of a panel where the student has done more for preparation and logistics. And uh, it's pretty exemplary work. So if Michael is here, I want to just uh, acknowledge him. But I think he actually stepped out. He's probably doing logistics right now he is. for lunch. He so is. He is. <laughs> it's quite fitting that he isn't here for that recognition. So today I'm going to talk about my article in the Pepperdine Law Review. It's titled, Do You Believe He Can Fly? And generally speaking, it's about the role of disability law for players with mental health conditions. And more specifically, it's about an NBA player who as a consequence of general anxiety disorder is afraid of flying. For most of this season he has not been with his team, most of the time he has been home, and most of the time he has been communicating almost exclusively through Twitter. The player's name is Royce White, who until he left for the NBA last May was a star college player at Iowa State. In fact, at Iowa State he was the only Division I basketball player in 2011-2012 to lead his team in points, rebounds, assists, steals, and block shots. That's five categories. That's pretty remarkable to have any player do that. He has the size uh, of, a re of a power forward, the skill set of a point guard. Some have compared him to Ma a young Magic Johnson. He's not that good, and I don't think he would ever say he is. But you get the idea of what kind of multi-talented player Royce White is. In fact, based purely on talent, scouts say he would have certainly been a top 10 pick in last year's draft, and some even say he would have been a top three pick if you take away a part of him that is greatly limiting his career. And draft position matters, because in the NBA it's the only way to get into the league. You have to go through the draft to be eligible, and the NBA uses a rookie wage scale where where you're picked dictates how much you're going to make. In last year's draft, the number three pick was guaranteed a two-year contract worth at least $8 million. $8 million. Player pick 10, four and a half million. Player pick 20, a little less than 3 million. All of them making a fortune, to be sure. But you can see that where you're picked in the draft has a huge bearing on how much you're going to make. And also, if there are any agents in the room, what kind of commission you can expect from that player. White fell in the draft to the Houston Rockets at number 16, which netted him a guaranteed 3.5 million over two years. A lot of money, to be sure, but much less than what his talent would have suggested he would have gotten. And what hurt White in the draft was mental health. Specifically, as I mentioned, White suffers from general anxiety disorder, also known as GAD. GAD refers to persistent, excessive, unrealistic worries about everyday occurrences. These worries can be outright disabling. Although numbers vary, a conservative estimate on the percentage of the population that has GAD is about 5%, so a pretty good number. GAD can cause a whole bevy of problems, sleeplessness, stomach pains, shortness of breath, panic attacks, many other symptoms. A GAD is brought on by what are called triggers. Triggers are circumstances that wouldn't bother us, but for people with GAD, cause them to suffer these really debilitating occurrences. Uh, for some, it can be fear of dental procedures. Now, I don't like going to a dentist, I can assure you, but I don't you know, have a massive 
uh, reaction to the thought, uh, also fear of escalators. And for Royce White, it's fear of going on a plane. Now, a lot of people don't like flying. Uh, flying isn't comfortable. I just flew from Boston uh, to here. Uh, and as pretty as New Hampshire is, my God, Malibu. Uh, I think I'm with Jeff. I think my resume is uh, completed and beat me to the punch. Uh, but, but, but for many, while flying is an uncomfortable experience, it isn't disabling. I think there's a, there's a point where it, it changes. White has had it, he believes, his whole life. He grew up in a small town in Minnesota and didn't fly much. He's tried to treat it through a, ver a variety of ways, Prozac, Xanax, Benadryl, and some other medicines, none of them seem to work. And also, as he has noted, that they cause side effects. And if you're a pro athlete or a college athlete, having <coughs> serious side effects from a medicine can make it difficult to play. And none of those medicines have been effective. There are a variety of other treatments that I'm not aware of him trying, including exposure therapy programs, where basically you fly a little bit over time and you eventually get better at it. There is also hypnosis that for some has been effective, but none that we know of has worked for White. White's not the first athlete to deal with the severe fear of flying. Jackie Jensen, a right fielder for the Boston Red Sox and the American League most valuable player in 1958, had to end his career early because of flying. As baseball started flying more, that disability became a, a pretty considerable issue for him. We all know that legendary football coach John Madden doesn't fly. Uh, it's something that's well known. It hasn't limited him per se. In fact, it's sort of part of his aura, I think. But he's not playing in the NBA. He's not playing all the time during the week. White has flown on occasion. In fact, his grandfather, although his grandfather drove him to many games during college, uh, he flew at least, a, the numbers vary depending upon what source you want to use, but apparently about a dozen times during college he flew, including to Italy. So the Rockets thought, look, we understand he has this, but he got over it in college, so why wouldn't he be able to do it in the NBA? And the early returns were pretty promising. Last summer, uh, White flew from Houston to Las Vegas to be part of the summer league where uh, the Rockets rookies and some other free agent players would play. He was successful there. He then flew to New York City for a rookie orientation program, and he flew back. Again, things looked pretty good, but then something changed. White told the Rockets right before the start of training camp in October that he was nervous about all the flying expected of him. Now to be sure, playing in the NBA requires a lot of time in the, in the air. The average NBA player goes on 60 flights during an NBA season. The Rockets, because of where they're positioned geographically, are actually on the higher end of flying. And maybe this is something the Rockets should have thought about, you could argue. 98 scheduled flights for the Rockets players this season. Almost 100 flights during an NBA season if you're playing on the Rockets. Uh, and of course, some of these flights are across country. Some of them are into Canada. It's a lot of flying. White told the Rockets that he wanted to travel by bus in lieu of flying, and that he would do so at his own expense. Uh, after White, he said this would be the case for most games. He thought he could fly some of the time, not specific as to how often he could fly. But basically what he w conveyed to the Rockets was, this is too much flying. I find it disabling. I will fly when absolutely necessary, but otherwise I'm gonna travel by car and I'll pay my own fare. After White missed a week, week of training camp because the Rockets didn't go along with this, and just, you know, you hear a week of training camp, you don't think that's a big deal. If you're an NBA player, that's a huge deal. If you're an NBA rookie and you missed your first week at camp, you're missing some crucial time, and it certainly isn't going to reflect well on your coach that you're not there. Uh, the Rockets told him, look, we're invested in you. We want you to succeed. And you could argue that the Rockets' interests in Royce White are the same. The Rockets want him on the court. It doesn't serve their purpose to have him at home, and it doesn't serve Royce White's purpose to be at home. Uh, and initially, it looked like they had struck a deal. White came back to work. They reached some type of agreement where he would fly only when absolutely necessary. He went to training camp, but didn't play all that much. And then he, and the team told him that he was gonna be reassigned to the D-League team for the Rockets, the Vipers. Uh, he said, no, that's not gonna work. And he decided to leave, and the Rockets said, look, you have to go work. You didn't get a lot of time at training camp. You missed training camp because of this issue. We just want you to go develop your game. Two other rookies were being sent down. And if you have an NBA contract and you're sent down, you're still paid your NBA salary. So keep in mind, while it's, I guess you could argue stigmatizing to be sent down, it doesn't affect your, your contract. White said, in essence, I'm out of here. And he went home. 
And he stayed home until the middle of January, where during this time, he took a lot of shots at the Rockets on Twitter. Uh, he argued that the team was insensitive, that he argued that uh, the team was not, was essentially discriminating against him. Uh, he has almost 200,000 followers on Twitter. He tweets, varies, but 50 to 100 times a day uh, is not uncommon. He's created a Twitter hashtag named Anxiety Troopers so that people can find all of the related tweets to his condition. And he, keep in mind, he doesn't say fear of flying. He says it's general anxiety disorder. And this is something that he's communicated to me about, that he argues that this, you, I'm talking about fear of flying, but it, that's the only part of it. That's just a trigger. The fundamental issue is not fear of flying. It's that he has general anxiety disorder, which is brought on by fear of flying. Uh, I will say that some of his tweets were, were pretty harsh of the Rockets, and I know the Rockets uh, were reading them and not particularly happy about them. Uh, at the end of January, he and the Rockets got together and agreed on a mental health protocol where White wanted to have an independent doctor decide whether he, would have to, whether he could play in a game. The Rockets would not go along with that because the Rockets said, we can't amend our, your contract under labor law and under the collective bargaining agreement. We're unable to make this type of concession to your contract, to make it essentially special for you. Uh, however, the NBA approved uh, an agreement where White would have a doctor who would have input. It's not clear how much input and whether he can play. They went along with that. White was sent down to the Vipers, and he played there for a couple of months. He played 14 games for the Vipers, including a 68-hour car ride uh, to go from San Bern Hildago to, to Santa Cruz in order to play in two, two games because he didn't want to go on a on a plane, obviously, given his disability. Uh, middle of March, White left the team again. Uh, he said that the very hectic playoff schedule was something that just wasn't going to work with his disability. He left, and then about a week later, came back, and then he left again. And now, last I know, he's back but not playing. So that's where Royce White is right now in, in his career. Uh, it's unclear what the Rockets are going to do beyond that. Uh, my impression is that the Rockets may not keep him, Oh, I don't know that as a fact, but I know that the Rockets have found this to be a pretty, pretty challenging situation. Uh, and also, you know, he hasn't excelled. He went to the Vipers and he played pretty well, but it wasn't as if he's, you know, he doesn't project yet as the next LeBron. And, and you wonder if he did, maybe, maybe the, the situation would be a little bit different. But in my article, I explore what kind of legal claims White may have against the Rockets and the NBA, and also whether there are more constructive solutions than turning to law to resolve a situation like this. This is really a unique situation. You know, so far today we've been talking about systems, right? College players, the NCAA, uh, rules, antitrust law. This is really about someone who doesn't fit in. This is about someone who rules weren't designed to contemplate. And this is probably maybe the bigger issue here is that mental health is an understated issue in collective bargaining. And I think it's an understated issue in college sports that probably deserves uh, more time when you have unique individuals who don't fit the system, if you will. If White intends to sue the Rockets and the NBA, he would likely seek recourse under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. The ADA protects those with disabilities from employer discrimination. Uh, disabilities have to be lasting and diagnosable. They must also substantially limit a major life activity, which refers to essentially a day-to-day -day activity that the typical person does. Uh, walking, breathing, bathing, those are some major life activities. If an employee's disability and impact on a major li life activity results in ADA protection, he or she is normally considered a qualified employee, and importantly, an employer must make reasonable accommodations to a qualified employee. Now, I have much more law in the paper if you're interested in reading it. Anxiety disorders only give rise to about 2.5% of ADA claims, a pretty small number. I suspect that's gonna go up in the future as mental health becomes more recognized and more accepted as a serious issue and a, and a real health issue. Uh, I will say also that case law is very unfavorable for those bringing claims under the ADA with mental health issues. Uh, and Professor Weston has an article on this in terms of sports as well. She, she has a, a college athlete who argued that he had test-taking anxiety and, and other anxieties, and, and the court said, come on, you're just not trying hard. Well, maybe he really was trying hard, and he has a, an issue. Uh, and in my analysis, I'll just very briefly say that I look at the essential functions of being an NBA player. 
I go through an employment contract of the MBA and I look at you know, what, what grounds would White have? There's a 17-page contract that stipulates that he has to be a skilled player, things that you would expect. There's very little reference to travel. In, in a 17-page detailed contract, very little reference other than per diem and some other things. Uh, I should note that White's anxiety problems don't, you could argue, they don't limit his ability to play basketball. In fact, once he gets on a court, he, the crowds, the things that I think would make any of us nervous, don't impact him. It's literally getting to work. So this is a distinguishable characteristic from Casey Martin. Right? Casey Martin, the golfer who argued that a reasonable accommodation would be being able to use a cart to get around a golf course because of a, a serious leg disability that he had and still has, and the Supreme Court agreed. There was a pretty notable dissent from Justice Scalia in it, but that's arguably not relevant here. This isn't about Royce White playing basketball. It's about getting to work. Uh, I looked at case law involving essential functions of NBA players, and you can read about them in the draft. I talk about Roy Tarpley, a player that some of you may recall. Uh, he argued that he was being discriminated against by the NBA because they wouldn't let him in for a third time after a series of drug and alcohol related issues. He wanted to come back when he was fairly old. Interestingly, the EEOC ruled in his favor. Now, he then sued and it was settled out of court. Uh, also, there, there's been an NBA player named uh, Coutinho Mobley who argued that uh, his disability was he had uh, HCM, a heart disease. And he argued that a reasonable accommodation would be having a, a device that would shock him back to life if, God forbid, he collapsed during an NBA game. Uh, the Knicks didn't want to do that, and a court agreed. The Knicks thought, the court said, you know, that's just too much. You can't have a situation like this. So there's actually very little case law involving how do you accommodate an athlete who has a disability. Uh, Casey Martin notwithstanding, and, and I think in the context of Roy, uh, Royce White, we have a player whose issue is getting to work, where, court, where there's very little case law about disabilities of getting to, to, getting to and from work, and it's not particularly favorable for the employees. But here you could say, well, how else is he going to play in the NBA? This isn't really choosing. Uh, so anyway, the, the article concludes by saying, I know I'm just about out of time. The article concludes by saying, uh, let, let's, let's not go to court. Let's go to Israel. I propose that Royce White needs to play in a league where you don't fly. Uh, the, the reality is you cannot have an NBA player who doesn't fly. The, for one, there are protections for players that are implicated if you change that. So the Rockets can't unilaterally change their schedule. The NBA can't unilaterally change the league schedule because there are protections for players. So I, I don't really see how you play in the NBA without an accommodation. But in Israel, there are 12 teams located within driving distance. Uh, of course, he would have to get there some way. I get that. Someone's going to say, well, how is he going to get there? <laughs> there are boats. Swim. You can swim. You can take a boat. Uh, and, and, and I know salaries are not the same in Israel, but they're not bad. In fact, I talked to a couple agents, and they told me he can make 250 to 500 a year. It's not as good as the NBA. He's not as, as much of a celebrity. English is spoken in Israel. There are a bunch of American players there. Uh, it's an interesting, I, I mean, I think it's interesting. I don't think it's going to happen. But uh, and then I, and the article concludes as I'm concluding by saying that uh, the NBA and Players Association, and also more broadly speaking, sports, and it can include college, they have to be thinking more about people who don't fit the norm. That it's not only about systems, it's also about those with unique conditions, that perhaps there are ways of creating more input for, for physicians in situations like this. Thank you so much, I'm out of time, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open this up to the panelists if you have questions or responses to each other. Professor Lazaroff? Uh, a couple of quick responses to Gabe uh, and, and generally about the rule of reason. You know, the amateurism argument I don't think is completely dead because some of the case law says to the extent the NC2A is branding their sports as uh, different from professional sports, and to the extent it's perceived as not the equivalent of, say, AAA or AAA baseball, uh, that's expanding output by providing a different product. The problem I have with that argument is not with the theory, but with the facts, because as I said, my view is that the state 
distinctions already broken down. With respect to the social justification arguments, you recall that when the Third Circuit, uh, I think it was the Third Circuit, might have been the first, decided the Brown case, it said that the court should take social justifications into account on remand uh, with respect to universities in the Ivy Overlap Group exchanging financial aid information. Now that has been dealt with through a, a narrow antitrust exemption which allows schools not to fix tuitions or financial aid but to exchange information subject to certain conditions. And when I teach that case, I say, well, we're not supposed to take social justifications into account. How can the court do this? And people generally look and say, well, they just did it. And I say, well, if you think about it as expanding the output of educational opportunities, you might be able to work it into a traditional antitrust analysis, just as in the context of NC2A sports, if in fact keeping caps on what players can get would actually increase opportunities for non-revenue male athletes and female sports, uh, you might be able to work it into a, a, an antitrust argument if in fact uh, uh, that's, that's what, what is going to happen. I'm not convinced that the money is really being being channeled that way, uh, not uniformly and, and, and arguably not enough. And with respect to the general comment about antitrust law uh, being a, a waste of time, uh, I reject that emphatically because uh, it's what I've done for 30 years or so. But more importantly, you know, it, it's not an unprincipled analysis. If you, if you study the rule of reason, it is a structured methodology with shifting burdens of proof Plaintiff comes forward, defines the market, proves anti-competitive effects within the market. Defendant comes back, offers pro-competitive justifications. Plaintiff can then rebut by showing significantly less restrictive alternatives. Uh, it's not just a free-for-all. And so my response to that would be we use reasonableness tests in various areas of the law. It's a little more complicated here, but I think it works and it keeps a lot of us employed. <laughs> um, Maureen? Uh, did Gabe, was that a question directed to you? And then I want to re respond. Oh, okay. I? Oh, oh, go ahead. Okay. You go first. Go okay. Well, you know, uh, back to my theory of antitrust law being uh, a uniquely bad regulator of, uh, of business activity, uh, it's a rule of reason. I have problems with the standard, as I've, I've mentioned. It's a, but we could go on. It's applied by a jury. It's a notoriously expensive litigation. Uh, yeah, antitrust law is, and, and it, it's, it's hard to predict answers. So it's not a very useful rule of law for uh, business enterprises or you know uh, joint enterprises like the NCAA to make a, a solid prediction as to whether their next proposed activity will will violate that law. So uh, yeah, I, I do. I find it very problematic. But go ahead, Gabe. Sorry. It sounds like the NCAA would agree. I, with I would you. just say that you know securities. You could say the same thing about securities litigation, mass tort litigation. That's why we're lawyers, and why we make us go to school and learn stuff. And the point you make about juries, uh, I, I see that as a valid point. I think often, if you look at the USFL. Uh, a monopoly case against the NFL. Yeah, you monopolize the market and we're going to give you a dollar, but we'll treble it to three dollars, so good luck with that. So I, I agree with your point about juries. That's a problem in complex litigation. Uh, and so I'll give you that one. Professor Feldman. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think in terms of the, of the amateurism argument, I agree that it's not dead. I mean, we, we've seen, that. I think that's part of the problem, is it's, it's not dead, and the only people who th think it shouldn't be dead seem to be the, the judges. Um, and everyone seems to predict given the wide disparity in what the schools are making and what the athletes are not making that a judge will look at this and say this is absurd we can't we can't give you the amateurism defense anymore where i think it does work maybe from the antitrust perspective is exactly what you said the reason we need amateurism is not because we want them to be students we want it to be we want them to be amateurs so we can make a lot of money because if they are paid then they're going to look like minor league players so the NCAA will look like a minor league, and who wants to watch a minor league? We like to watch the best athletes in the world. People say the reason MLS is not popular in the U.S., soccer is not popular in the U.S., is because we want to watch the best. The best don't play for the MLS. Best play in Europe. Well, then why are we watching college football and college basketball? You look at the tournament, some of those games are horrible. 
level of skill is terrible. Why do we watch? We watch because of, is it amateurism or is it because they're associated with schools? So I, I think it gets back to that empirical point. Can the NCAA prove that the reason we watch is because they're not paid versus the reason we watch is because they have to represent Michigan or Duke or Pepperdine? They haven't been able to answer that question. But they haven't been required to answer that question. If they do have to answer that question, I think they lose. Rick Losig. But something that was brought up in the first panel is that the majority of college athletes are not revenue-producing sports, and they benefit from the revenues that are come from those sports. For example, I have two younger siblings that have, were lucky enough to play Division I in basketball, one brother and one sister. So should my brother, who's a revenue-producing athlete, um, be compensated at the expense of people like my sister, who are athletes in non-revenue-producing sports? So what's more important, compensating that small percentage or making sure that there's scholarships for a large group of people? So who do you guys think should make these decisions and where do you draw the line in balancing that? Okay, the question asks about the distinction between revenue producing s athletes and revenue producing sports and not. And if we have the open season on antitrust laws where payers are played, how would you address that treatment and what should the law do? Well, we have Title IX, which creates requirements of proportionality and equality in various areas. The NC2A does require for Division I competition that there be a minimum number of win women's and men's sports. Uh, so I think that helps the situation. But I would flip it back to you and say, what about the fact that uh, the athlete in Division I basketball or FBS football is generating revenue for the university uh, and the non-revenue sports are not, and, and how can you justify that on an economic basis? You, you would be saying, well, there are other non-economic justifications for that, to create more sports opportunities for men and women. And I'm suggesting that, that if that could be guaranteed subject to an antitrust exemption, I'd be more sympathetic to it. And within an antitrust analysis, without any exemption, if you could demonstrate that that is actually expanding opportunities uh, for the non-revenue sports participants, that, that might be persuasive. The fact is, empirically, despite Title IX, football still, from what I'm reading, is still getting you know, the overwhelming bulk of the money, uh, Title IX issues are being addressed by cutting out men's sports uh, to create the proportionality uh, required by the regulations. But uh, I don't know if that adequately answers your question, but uh, I understand the problem. We don't want to end up with just basketball and football on the men's side, and uh, I don't think Title IX would allow that anyway. Yeah, and I, and I, th I think you're right. There's got to be a balance. I don't think we're getting that balance from antitrust law because I just don't think it's, it's able to provide that. But in fairness to the NCAA, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when their television restriction was, was struck down, their deal with ABC was you're going to uh, show our football games on television, but you're also required to show our Division II and Division III championship games and show our wrestling, volleyball, soccer championships on television. So they were thinking about those other sports. I mean, that's a pretty good indication that they do want to leverage football and basketball to help their other sports. They've gotten away from that a little bit, in part because of the NCAA, the Board of Regents case, because tying. now it's, well, and the tying, right? That could be a tying violation, but, or there might be a legitimate justification for doing that, but that gets into a, <laughs> you guys don't want to hear about that. Um, but but I, I think we're at the point now where the Board of Regents case encouraged them, forced them to compete with each other to make these dollars for football, basketball. What about the schools that are getting left behind or the programs that are getting left behind? I don't think antitrust law is equipped to give that balance. That's why I think we need a new structure in place. So if we just had the exemption for antitrust laws, it seems like now the only people who lose are the students when they're bringing in the claims in antitrust law, but we can't contain the problems of coaches' salaries, the whole arms race. Any, but, any thoughts on that? But if you create the exemption well, without any oversight, right. you can't guarantee right. that result that we're being asked about. Okay. Jeff? Well, I, you know, I was just going to mention, I mean, I think Title IX presents a huge issue with respect to, you know, compensating players in revenue sports because Title IX, as you know, measures equality along three dimensions. One of them is resource allocation. So every, um, every dollar that's poured into the football program must be poured into women's sports. And uh, 
and so that would be extremely expensive. The other issue uh, is with compensation. I mean, coaches' salaries are so high because they're complementary goods, to use an economics term. In other words, the colleges cannot play, pay the players, so they, they pay the next best thing, the coach who, who recruits the player. And uh, so it, there's a pretty good economic argument to make that if we did compensate players, a lot of that would come from the coach's salary. I mean, coaches should be well paid, but the, their skill set is not so unique mm -hmm. that it would command that kind of money. I mean, it's, is it harder to become a law professor or to be a major college basketball coach? Uh, law professor. Law professor. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know our, our salaries are lower than all, many people we graduate in their first year. So uh, even though our skills are, we think, a little bit rare, you know, it's not that rare. It's neither is the college basketball I coach or football so. coach. So um, <laughs> they're probably they're probably complementary goods. Good. Well, we have time for just one question. I'm going to take the moderator's liberty. Um, you're too easy on the NBA. If Casey Martin has the right to force the PGA to allow him to ride a cart, um, why should Royce White go to Israel? Yeah. So <laughs> I, the difficulty I just see is mechanically how. How do, you have, how do you have a regular schedule, an, an 82-game schedule, where there are 30 franchises literally in all points of the country, also in Canada? I just don't see, unless literally, the, the, unless a reasonable accommodation is to prolong the schedule so that there's more time between games and prolonging the NBA season maybe to a year-round schedule, I guess then the question is sort of, is that a reasonable accommodation for one player? And maybe it is. I mean, maybe, maybe a, a, a adequate design takes us into account. I think a better design, or a more practical design, would be to have a system in place for medical protocol where mental health is considered an illness, is considered an injury that has to be treated like other injuries. And I think having input from a physician uh, is something that's, that's helpful. All right. On that note, I'd like to thank this panel for a fascinating discussion. Um, I'm going to put everyone, let's put our shades on and go out and have some lunch. Um, in SR1, there are going to be a couple of tables, so we will.